be focusing on tackling the emergencies mm, uh, and telling to the growing hernias, particularly in this changed atmosphere of hospitals caused by the COVID-19 out outbreak. So we'll, you will be covering the growing hernias as well as how to tackle in this period, in the difficult period. If any emergency, honey emergencies are uh, we we need to face. Dr. Parvin Bhatia, the screen is yours and uh, the mic is yours. Dhanabad. <laughs> and I must say at the outset that this too shall pass. Frankly speaking, our thoughts are loud and clear that. This time is not going to stay. This too shall pass. And we should stay positive. We should stay healthy. We should stay safe. I think as all of us know that God has, as Anil Sharma had also pointed out, that it has taken, God has started giving us lessons to overall the mankind, over all the rivers, the earth, and so on and so forth. So our thinking is, let us invest in our health. Let us stay positive. This too shall pass. And this time, believe me, is not going to come again. And today I am going to speak on groin hernia repair and how to deal with emergencies during the COVID-19 pandemic. All of us have seen the operation theaters, but now the attire of the surgeons have changed. And to be honest, my feeling is that it is all about finding the calm in the chaos. And calmness is superpower. If we remain calm, and if we deal with the, this kind of pandemic in a stepwise manner, as Dr. Anil Sharma had also pointed out, that the initial phase of lockdown, none of us were operating, but gradually we started taking emergencies and gradually we have to build up so that ultimately our job is to take care of our health workers, one, to take care of ourselves, two, and the, to take care of the patients and the patients' families. I have done a little literature search, and in this, we have found that European Hernia Society EHS guidance for the management of adult patients with a hernia during COVID-19 pandemic also. Again, the thoughts, I think Dr. Anil Sharma had beautifully mentioned that we have to take all the precautions. One, the social distancing. Two, the mask, mask, mask. Mask is a must for each and everyone. And then we call this as SMS. S is for sanitation or hand washing. So we should be very, very careful that one, we teach our patients also that they should take these precautions. We teach our younger colleagues also that they should take all the precautions because safety has no limits, excellence has no limits. And then we will be definitely in a state that we are not responsible for giving the infection to the patient also. That is utmost important in our thoughts. And this is a beautiful article which has come from New York and it was published on 10th of June 2020 that what they, where are the hernias? A paradoxical decrease in emergency surgery during COVID-19 pandemic. They had studied and they had shown that in 2019, during this period of two and a half to three months, the numbers of elective surgeries were far higher Elect the emergency surgeries were also far higher. But because of the fear in the minds of the people that they are not even coming 
for the emergency surgeries and that ultimately can lead on to challenges in the form of morbidity and mortality. The mortality in elective surgery, it has been seen to be of the order of 0.2%, but in emergency surgeries, we will define this as hernia accidents. That means incarceration and strangulation, and this mortality goes up to the order of 4%. And this World Society of Emergency Surgeries, they have also given a guideline in 2020 April issue in which they have studied that in 2013 and then in 2017, they had given the guidelines for doing the emergency surgeries and especially for the complicated abdominal wall hernias. And again, all of us, I, what I am going to do in next 15, 20 minutes is that I will be taking the support of these guidelines which have been given by Endos Emergency Surgeries and the CDC guidelines, that is Center for Disease Control and Prevention for Wound Classification. All of us know that class one to class four, and it all depends on whether we are operating in a clean and wounds, clean environment, clean contaminated, contaminated, dirty or infected wounds. Again, the grading has been done and it is, it is a great thought, especially for younger colleagues to learn that G-R-A-D-E, grading of recommendation, A is for assessment, development and evaluation. And the grading of the recommendation has been divided into two. That means grade one and grade two. Grade one recommendation is a strong recommendation and grade two is a weak recommendation. And grade one and grade two have further been divided into grade one A, one B and one C and then two A, B, C. So that ultimately we are talking about the evidence-based medicines. And now I am going to question myself first so that ultimately we are able to answer what comes to our mind. That what is the timing of surgery, especially when we are having the emergencies. If the elective surgery is there, definitely it is the time to still postpone but if the patient has come in an emergency, then what is the exact time? What is the best time to operate? Whether we should operate by laparoscopy or by open method? Question number three would be that if, for example, if it is a contaminated wound, whether we are going to use the mesh or we are going to do a non-mesh repair? Question number four will be, is there any role of biological mesh today and especially question number five will be there will be some situations there are people who are having comorbidities like diabetes heart disease and so on and so forth so if they have some complication in hernia and if they are presenting in an unfavorable unstable position with the septic shock then what is the best answer and what kind of antibiotics have to be given in, for example, CDC class one, clean, two, dirty, class four. So what kind of antibiotic prophylaxis has to be given? And especially as Dr. Anil ha had also shown, now is the importance of NSC cyst also because they are very close to the patient's uh, respiratory tract. And if they get infected, and frankly speaking, in, in India also, in Delhi also, we have had NSCs who have succumbed to COVID-19. So our thinking is that such thoughts have to come to our colleagues that whether the patient should be given general anesthesia, regional anesthesia, or the emergency should be tackled in local anesthesia. Now, this kind of hernia, if it presents to us, then we are never ever sure that whether accident has occurred or it has not occurred. What I mean to say, these are called as hernia accidents. The, if it is an incarcerated hernia, 
it could be because of there is a narrow opening or there is an adhesion in sacs and that is not letting the hernia sac go into the abdomen or the second accident can be strangulated hernia means whether because of the compromised blood circulation the patient is suffering so for this the answer to question number 1 is that immediate surgery should be done if we are having a slightest doubt of strangulation there have been papers i would present that way also later on of watchful waiting or manual tactics if you are able to reduce it but these kind of manual reduction or tactics can be helpful only in those incarcerated hernias rather than in strangulated hernias elapsed the basic thought is that elapsed time from onset to surgery is the most important prognostic factor and one should as if we are able to diagnose the strangulation and then there is a grade 1c that means there is a strong recommendation that one should always believe on sirs that is systemic inflammatory response syndrome if the patient comes to us and if the patient is having fever tachycardia leukocytosis and then if we get the investigations in the form of lactate d dimer and cpk if the cpk is high d dimer is high we definitely can think and there is a grade 1c recommendation that the patient must be having a strangulation and that can lead on to challenge in this situation if the patient has come to us with comorbidities but with also strangulation i think to my mind ct scan is a must you do not know the anatomy unless you know the ct anatomy i think for younger colleagues we should always impress that it, it, the time is not wasted if you are getting wiser by seeing the ct scan yourself and there will be some situations in which for example the this is a situation in female patient she had are you able to see the video running so this is a patient who had presented with obstructed femoral hernia and this she was an elderly female and then we could reduce the hernia but uh, believe me it is a better thought to check 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 recheck cross check counter check check and check we could see that maybe it is hydrogenic maybe because of the taxes that there is a small entrotomy and one should definitely introspect whether i will be able to do the suturing i have got those skill set of doing the intracorporeal suturing or i do not have the skill set then i should convert it and then close the hydrogenic perforation but now there are two schools of thought whether one should place in a mesh in such kind of environment or not that is very very important i will be dwelling on this aspect slightly later on our thoughts are that in situations in 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 practices in which we are doing lot of laparoscopic hernia repair for example then definitely we should have a low threshold of doing the diagnostic laparoscopy and we will be able to differentiate whether it is accident is of incarceration or it is of strangulation if it is for example incarceration and if we feel that we are able to do the hernia repair by tapp method and we will not be compromising on any aspect then laparoscopy definitely has upper hand as compared to the open surgery regarding the aerosol creation in covid era i think this is very very important initial phase in from italy and from other countries also all of us have learned that when we are doing the laparoscopic surgery we as dr anil had also shown that one has to be very careful about the aerosols one has to be careful about the smoke evacuation what we do is that we put in a various needle at the palmer's point and connect with the tubing to a to 
the bottle which is placed down with the hypochlorite solution so that there are no gas which is flowing out as we are using the energy source that the fumes are also going out and they are not coming to us or to the assistant or to any surgeon the thinking is that ultimately our thoughts are that we should be able to find out whether it is incarceration versus strangulation if it is a strangulation then depending on our skill set we should be able to convert it into an open or if if we are experienced enough then one can do the resection and osmosis laparoscopically also if for example we have gone with the diagnostic lab and now we are converting into open we call this as hybrid technique the important aspect would be that the site of the incision and the size of the incision will also be monitored so that is the advantage of doing the diagnostic laparoscopy but again i would put it this way it has got grade 2 b recommendation because there was a big if that if your center is doing lot of laparoscopic hernia repair then this is the answer that one can go ahead but if you are not doing lot of hernia repair then it is better to go with open method and do the uh, repair sutured repair though it may have a slightly more recurrences but you have saved the life saved the intestines and the patient is also safe now in those kind of situations in which for example we have to take a decision whether to place in a mesh or we have not to place in a mesh in a cdc class 1 when the it is a clean wound clean environment then synthetic mesh is good enough in cdc class 2 that means clean contaminated wounds environment then synthetic mesh yes can be placed but specially in the class 3 cdc that means there is a clean contaminated with spillage with spillage of the intestinal contents then answer is refrain or withdraw yourself from placing in a mesh just do the primary repair and that should be enough and again there are situations there are people who are provoke for telling us that we can use the biological mesh specially in dirty wounds specially in class 4 for example lot of features of spillage or soilage of the intestinal content is there or the peritonitis has been there because the patient came late then at that stage biological mesh can be placed but that is the reason that it comes under grade 2c recommendation that it is a weak kind of recommendation rather than a strong recommendation and if the patient is unstable if the patient has had lot of comorbidities the first thing is that one has to manage the sepsis second is that obviously the whole of the team that means the people who are physicians cardiologists and especially geriatric physicians they should manage this kind of patient so that we optimize them and then do the open repair and do the minimum and come out rather than sticking on to the laparoscopic thoughts or minimal excess advantage to the patient again and again i would question myself whether anti microbial prophylaxis has to be given and what is the class 1 evidence if, for example if the if the patient is having clean environment short term antibiotics are enough but in class 2 and class 3 dirty and dirty contaminated wounds 48 hours antibiotics have to be given and in class 4 the anti microbial treatment has to be continued as if it is a dirty environment and that can lead on to patient being okay now again about the anesthesia whether we have to go in for local versus regional versus ga i think in the present era we should take lot of precautions that we should wear the mask we should wear the face shield the anesthetist also should take lot of the precautions and similarly our ot staff should also take 
all the precautions of take, making sure that we are wearing the PP and then only because that can be the one step can lead on to cascade of events and that can lead on to silent spreader. The asymptomatic people can also spread the infection and that can lead on to challenges. This is a beautiful publication which has come recently only a few days back. The strategies for follow-up after hernia surgery during the COVID-19 pandemia. What I mean to say is there have been centers who have started the hernia surgeries, but elective surgeries definitely take a back seat. The emergency surgeries have to be done. And in emergency, we have to be very, very careful. The ultimate aim is that we should make sure that one, we are saving life. We are getting the COVID test done of the patient and then posting as early as possible. Usually, normally, it takes 24 hours for the reports to come. But in emergency situations, one can go ahead and one can take the universal precautions. But as soon as the report comes, then again, one has to be very, very careful. So the, uh, I'm talking about the manual reduction of hernia under analgesia or sedation. Again, in our post-graduation days, in a non or pre-COVID era, we have been taught that we should do the taxes but in an absolute gentle manner. We should not sit onto the scrotum of the person and then cause a lot of bleeding inside. So if we are able to postpone that emergency for maybe a few days, it's fine. But if we are, we are not able to be successful after Texas, then it is a good idea to go in for emergency surgery and ultimately make a difference in that life. Because all of us know the mortality rate in elective surgery is different, is 0.2, whereas the mortality rate in emergency surgery can be of the order of 4%. And again, as now the time has gone, and you can never be certain, I would say that this too shall pass, but still the uncertainties are there. So one has to have a moral responsibility that once we are doing the essential surgeries and we are doing the non-essential surgeries in this pandemic period, we have to be very, very careful that we do not cause any infection positive to the patient or to healthcare workers and then to ourselves and to our family members. In, in conclusion, I would say the take home message for tackling the emergencies in groin hernia should be that we take universal precautions for each and every patient. Our thinking is that treat any and everyone as positive until proved otherwise. One. Second is that we should have a low threshold for getting the CECT done so that we are wiser that whether it is a incarceration or it is a strangulation. Third is that we should have a low threshold of diagnostic laparoscopy. Even if slight, I would say toxic fluid is there in the peritoneal cavity, but the intestines are having good color. They are, we are able to see that they are viable. It is a good idea to go on with your expertise for laparoscopic surgery and complete the procedure that will be definitely useful for the patient. Because if, for example, if you are doing by open method, still, if you are using the cautery, if you are using the suction, still the aerosol spread is there and that can also lead on to challenges. In the publications which I mentioned, even the peritoneal fluid can have the viral load. And that can increase and that can lead on to challenges. Again, we should have a thought that emergency hernia surgery carries a high mortality and morbidity. So it should be that we diagnose and treat the strangulated hernia as early as possible and then repair it 
and take care of all the comorbidities because the patient may have come late and that can become challenging for the survival of the patient. Again, if there is a spillage, if there is a strangulation, if a lot of toxic fluid is there, it is a good idea not to place in a mesh in CDC class 3 and class 4 repairs because that can lead on to challenges later on. Again, I am re-emphasizing that as Dr. Shamshul had also pointed out that at this stage, it is very, very important that as surgical leaders, we should remain positive. We should inculcate the feelings of positivity in our younger team and to the patients also that we should remain positive. This too shall pass. Practice till it hurts. Keep practicing till it does not hurt. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for your kind attention. More than welcome, I can answer any of your queries. Thank you very much. Again, I must say that I must thank Dr. Sardar Naim, Dr. Ramayu Chaudhary, Dr. Rahman, Dr. every one of you, that I honestly, I feel that Bangladesh or Dhaka is my second home. And I always love to be with you one and every time, definitely any opportunity is there. Thank you very much for this invite to, for this Harnia Society of Bangladesh. Thank you very much. God bless. Uh, you have to unmute yourself, sir. Dr. Shamsun, you have to unmute yourself. Thank you, Dr. Parvin Bhatia. Uh, as usual, uh, you have had a brilliant presentation and we enjoyed it thoroughly. And we cannot find any questions in the course QA box. Yes, there are questions. Uh, is any benefit to, to used biological mesh in CDC3 wound? As I mentioned... Is there any, is there any benefit of a biological mesh? Yes. As I mentioned that there are people who are using the CA biological mesh in class CDC class 3 and class 4. Definitely there are, but as, as all of us know, that biological mesh is also not the best mesh has yet come. And if we have had the occasion of using a lot of biological meshes, but we found that it because it is a remodeling process, the, in later on, the patient can have the bulge and it, the patient starts thinking that he has a hernia recurrence, but that is only a bulge because of the remodeling of the tissues which occurs. And in the initial phase, I would say the practical implication is that if there was a collection, if there was an infected environment, and if you have placed in a biological mesh, and if you have placed a maybe Jackson Pratt drain, that also can lead on to some kind of putrefied material coming out for a few days. And that usually one starts thinking that whether I am dealing with an infected environment or it has been cleared, but it is because of the remodeling of the biological mesh. So again, my thinking, our thinking is as far as possible, CDC3, avoid putting the mesh, do the primary repair, that's it. Stay CDC4, avoid putting it, but if there are situations, definitely one can try it, but final word has not been written yet. Uh, thank you, Dr. Parvin Bhatia, and thanks to uh, Professor Siddiqui for the question. And the next question is, should CT include chest also? This is from uh, Ruhul Hassan. I would say especially, very nice question, Dr. Nurulasan, that especially in this environment of COVID pandemic, the CT scan, HRCT, chest is an excellent indicator. For example, as all of us know that even if the patients, we get the COVID RT-PCR done, even if it is negative, but if we get the HRCT, 
that if it shows the infiltrates in the lower lobes, definitely the patient can become positive or patient may be having a, the asymptomatic carrier and that can become a challenge later on and that can develop into pneumonitis. So if in this environment, especially in the pandemic, if we are going in for CT abdomen, then it is a good thought to include the CT chest, maybe screening, so that we know that in, in that phase, the patient was not harboring the COVID infection. Good thought. Okay. Uh, uh, in CT scan of the hernia, uh, is there, uh, can it be, can the circulation be assessed as well? So yes. whether, yes. whether it is a, uh, vascularity has been jeopardized or not? Absolutely. Uh, good question. I, and especially for my younger colleagues, I must urge them and, and my senior colleagues that push them to go to the CT room, discuss with the CT persons, and then learn so many things. They show, the CT scan can show that whether there has been a twist in the vessels, whether there has been an internal rotation of the contents, whether there is a thickening of the tissues, whether the intestinal walls are thickened or they are not. The vascularity can also be seen. So our think, our request to younger colleagues is that please go to the CT room, discuss with the CT persons. Now is the time that the surgeon should also see the CT scan himself pre-operatively, Paraoperatively, he is seen inside the abdomen, and postoperatively, again, he should learn that yes, this was showing a strangulated segment, and that's it. So one can definitely get so much of information from the CT scan. Another question: uh, When a laparoscopy is needed, if if you want to inspect the viability of the gut, laparoscopy uh, is needed in a COVID patient positive, is it possible to uh, do it in regional anesthesia rather than general anesthesia? I would say that uh, no. All of us know that if, if, for example, some situations are there and it is a complicated situation at the moment. So if we do under regional anesthesia and because of the abdominal pressure of 15 millimeters mercury, Definitely the patient has pain because of the diaphragm irritation. And at that time, in those emergency situations, if the anesthetist has to intubate the patient to convert it into a general anesthesia, he can definitely invite corona infection. So our thinking is that no, whatsoever norms we have been following for laparoscopy, for all laparoscopy, we always push the general anesthesia. We should do it under general anesthesia, but take a lot of universal precautions in intubating the patient, but don't combine it with substandard regional anesthesia, then overpower it by general anesthesia. Thank you. Uh, you said, the, where are those hernias? <laughs> that's very that's very curious beautiful uh, is it due to is it due to only fear or yeah. anybody thinks uh, otherwise sure i he had this this paper sir, paper has beautifully published and this was published three days back only i was very happy to realize that where are those hernias most important and i remember 38 years back when i wrote the thesis then one, the patient had a hernia, inguinal hernia for 34 years and it was hanging up to the knee joint. And when I asked him that, why did you not get the surgery of hernia? He says, because of the fear. Fear of surgery, fear of surgeon and fear of the cost. And, and today the fear of death in the hospital has also been added. So these patients who were having some kind of semi-emergency or emergency, they are also in, this was a paper from publication from New York. So they are also in Bronx. They are also not coming to the hospital because they are thinking, because most of the patients are COVID plus, they may not harbor, they may not get the infection. So let us do some kind of maneuver at home and maybe come slightly later on. And that is leading on, they have compared beautifully three months of March, April, May of 2019 and 
three months of 2020, and then they have found that elective surgery has definitely gone down, but emergency surgeries of hernia has also come down. So where have they gone? Okay, thank you. One last uh, uh, question. Last question popped up. The how to close a large defect of uh, direct hernia uh, direct hernia defect using a laparoscopic technique. It's from anonymous. It's how you will close the defect, large defect in a large direct hernia. I would say, and especially when we are talking about the emergencies, if we are, have CDC one, that means clean environment, then it is good idea to close the defect not by suturing, not by suturing, but by placing in a mesh of 15 by 15 centimeters. And if the hernia is, you are not able, because it is challenging, if it is a large inguinal hernia, it is challenging to do the suturing and close it from within. It is a good idea to give an incision onto the inguinal region, convert it, and then close the defect by the suture method, maybe shoulders or maybe the whatsoever method. Or if you have a clean environment, then place in a mesh and come out so that we are saving the patient, we are saving the bowel loop, we are saving ultimately morbidity and mortality of the disease. Thank you. Uh, Samshri Alam. Mm -hmm. Yes. Samshri Alam, can you hear me? Professor Chaudhary, please go ahead. Uh, yes. Oh, I, I just wanted to add to uh, Parveen Bhatia regarding where is the hernias. I think this is also a common practice among the you know uh, patients to ask uh, a friend physician or a you know, family physician, what should we do at this time? And everybody is telling, don't go near to the hospital. This is probably another cause. Everybody is afraid of hospital now. I have a question to uh, Parvin. Yes, sir. Uh, from your general perception, from your general perception, uh, I don't think there is any study now, but among the surgeons, emergency surgeons doing emergency surgery, not only hernia, but any kind of emergency surgery. Some of our surgeons are also doing it here in Bangladesh. In, in India, what is the incidence of um, COVID infection among them? In, in the Do you find some? In the patients or in the doctors? No, no, among the doctors, surgeons, and OT staff. I mean, the operating staff. I, I, I think uh, I should not uh, uh, shy away from telling this that in the initial phase, in when the COVID started, healthcare workers were admitted in the hospital because of the positivity. And the theaters also, the technicians also. So it, it used to become a norm that every and everyone is becoming positive. This is for the best or betterment, or this is not for the betterment. Our thinking is that culture has to be there, that it has to be a silent spreader, and that can lead on to cascade of events. So my, it is our moral responsibility, and we have seen doctors also dying, surgeons also dying, of the, because they were seeing the patients, and then they were operating also, they became positive, and because they were having some comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and whatnot, and they succumbed to COVID. So our thinking is that you can, and there are surgeons, I know of at least 20 surgeons in Delhi who have become positive in, in last few days, and who had to be quarantined, and then ultimately they have restarted after becoming negative. So thinking is that we should take utmost precautions, and whatsoever precautions we are taking, Still, the God coronavirus will peep in through, and that can lead on to challenges. So we should protect ourselves, our okay. family, healthcare workers. But do, do you, uh, Parveen, do you think these statistics is uh, in comparison to uh, UK or uh, European standard? This is higher. I would say that it is equal in the sense that all of us know in UK also, in Italy also. There were around 1,200 health doctors have been infected. Today, only one of the Hernia Society and COVID positive. COVID positive. So our thinking is, it has been a universal phenomenon, whether in Italy, whether in UK, whether in, in India, or even in New York. 
many doctors have come to do this covid because whatsoever precautions we are taking may not be enough and ultimately we will be harboring and then again depends on the viral load uh, our uh, is uh, 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 compromised definitely the challenges can come so we have to be afraid of that let's be very honest and straight about it okay thank you Uh, thank you, Dr. Parvin Bhatia. Uh, Professor Sanwa, do you have any comment? Uh, yes, I I had a mind to ask Professor Parvin, the what is the incidence of getting COVID positive amongst the health workers at the moment? Is it different from two months ago? That what I feel the our people. initially could not really catch up the universal precaution to the extent what we are doing at the moment now i see my people working in this hospital they are getting much more cautious and they are doing it and you see the comment is that the through this universal precaution we have been much more clever with the hiv and also the hepatitis b so i would like to emphasize that it is the all the health workers should practice the universal precaution much more because we do not know much very much or anything better than this moment about combating the covid 19 with this present state of knowledge sure dr samsur i would definitely endorse that point that initially all of us were taken by uncertainty and we also never knew that what is the best universal precaution even yeah. but today believe me after this business political business of unlocking many people have started wearing the mask on their neck <laughs> and i see many surgeons who are hiding their necks rather than their nose and so our thinking is that mask is not a big ask we should definitely stress the patients also and we should take precautions for ourselves also that mask has to be n95 nothing beyond yeah. nothing below okay. one second yeah. is that all all of us the surgeons have been in a habit of washing the hands through and through we were having a habit of using the sanitizer but now the younger surgeons should also be taught that before examining any patient one should wear the gloves and definitely examine the patient and after that again one should take off the gloves the donning and doffing has to be done very carefully and then again sanitizers have to be what i mean to say that it will be a new norm that has to be set so that all of us remain positive remain safe that is very important and especially our healthcare workers thank you thank you